Just to give you some examples of his collaboration with AIT, he was at our 100X event last year and also hosted the 100X after party for us, which was one of the most memorable events of the year. He was also with us for the seventh Asia Conference on Earthquake Engineering, Structural Engineering Backbone of Built Environment 2018, and Dinner Talk by Ashraf Habibullah 2018, just to name a few. So another round of applause for Mr. Ashraf Habibullah, please. Now, our theme panel today is Tour 2030, What the Future Holds, which is also reflected in the theme of our launch event. Now, more than ever, it is obvious humanity as we know it may need to adapt in order to effectively address various existing issues as noted in a UNESCO report in 2015, including digital disruption, data revolution, and the role that science can play if we aim for a sustainable future. Now with COVID-19 upon us, we are seeing new and unexpected surges of uncertainty in all aspects of humanity. And to quote UNDP, for the first time in 100 years, the world is focused on a common goal, and that is battling coronavirus and attempt to recover. That seems like a lot on our plate, and we do have a lot to discuss. So it is timely that we hold a panel discussion looking forward amidst this global pandemic. Now on that note, I would like to start to invite our moderator and the panelists onto the stage. So here we first of all have our moderator, our Vice President for Knowledge Transfer, Dr. Naveed Anwar will be the moderator for the panel. Please welcome Dr. Naveed. Uh, maybe um, the moderator can be over here next to me. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> I can see my name here. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Now for the panelists, first up we have Ms. Gita Sarbawal, United Nations Resident Coordinator. Thank you. Dr. Sampan Silapanat, Vice President of Western Digital and Executive Committee Member at the Office of National Higher Education Science Research and Innovation Policy Council. And Mr. David Galipo, Founding Partner, SDGX, Singapore, EU, Australia, Director, UNIS Center, Near Future Lab. And now I will give the floor to the moderator. Uh, thank you so much, Tanisa, for setting the stage. And we were very glad to have the keynote speaker who has given us a lot of um, vision uh, in terms of especially what the energy will look like in the future. Uh, you know, future, talking about future has always fascinated human, human beings. And we have had uh, fortune tellers in the you know, past. People go to see them, ask them what, will, what their life would be in the future. <laughs> We have science fiction writers, you know, people have been looking at what they think, and we have had some futurists, as they call themselves, or we call them. And when I was growing up, I remember reading a book called Future Shock. It was published in 1970 by an author called Alvin Toffler. He is not really very highly regarded futurist, if you compare it to some other, you know, well-established academic, we can say. But he was still quite popular at that time. So um, he <coughs> his book at that time predicted many things or talked about many things. And many of them have actually come true. Some have not. Uh, but once, uh, you know, before he passed away, uh, he was asked, uh, what is a futurist's job? And one thing he said is that futurist's job is not to make predictions. <coughs> so then they said, you know, then why are you a futurist if you're not going to make prediction? And his answer was, that it's all about possibilities. The futurist sees and they think about what is possible. And what, so, and that 
thinking then leads to something being actually possible. So futurists are not really predicting something, but rather looking ahead and see what might be possible. So I think just to let everybody know that I'm not going to hold you to your prediction. So in 2030, we won't call you back <laughs> and say, oh, this is what you said. So please, this is just about possibilities and not necessarily about prediction. So, <laughs> <laughs> so please, you, know, uh, you can rest on that. So what are the possibilities that we are looking at? So obviously, the possibility could be of a bleak future, right? And many uh, you know, uh, science fiction movies and books have talked about bleak future. And some might argue that we are now actually in a bleak future of 2020. So if there was a panel like this in 2020, talking about, uh, in 2010, talking about 2020, probably they will not think about what we are re doing right now as a possible future unless they were looking at a bleak future. Of course, it has its uh, silver linings and all, but let's say that in some expect it is a kind of a bleak future. But moving ahead, we would like to look ahead for a brighter future and forget about the current future that we are currently passing through and for a moment think that hopefully this, and history has told us that things actually change and they, they will get better. So this is what we are talking about today is the possibility. So I'm going to request our three panelists to spend about five minutes each, not too long. We have, as you can know, the clock running, uh, to talk about what they think is possible, what we would like it to be, not necessarily what is possible, but what we, what we would like the future to be, and, and a related question, how we can make it happen. So those are the three things that I think we will start the discussion about. I will pass the torch to each one of you for five minutes, uh, starting with uh, Ms. Kita first. And uh, you being you know, in the UN and all, you have a probably a higher a bird's eye view or a higher elevated view than us. So please tell us what uh, you and your colleagues are thinking. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Anwar. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Anwar. I mean, uh, it's a pleasure to be here at AIT, and it's a pleasure to be discussing the future. And uh, you know, this forward-looking agenda is extremely important if we want to be impactful and if we want to be transformative. Right, so I'm really excited to be here today. Uh, I want to frame my, my remarks around trends, around what I see as the defining trends uh, that we need to leverage to achieve the sustainable development goals. Right? And, and um, uh, before I start, I want to say that this is the 75th year of the United Nations. And next year, Thailand will be celebrating its 75 years of being part of the United Nations. In many ways, this is uh, a milestone for multilateralism, which we all need to capitalize upon. In terms of uh, if we are serious about achieving the M uh, SDGs, we need to act now. Right? What does acting now mean? Acting now means looking at development challenges and seeing how we can address them through innovation, through science-based responses, and through forging partnerships with yourself, with the private sector, as you mentioned, with, uh, with the government, with academia and the youth, right? And, and youth in this is pretty central. If we are really serious, and each one needs to play to their, to their respective comparative advantages for us to be, us to be you know, certain about achieving the sustainable development goals. Now, let me very, very briefly talk about what I see as the four defining trends. And, and the, first, the first trend that we mentioned is climate change, which in many ways Mr. Harold Link spoke about. And climate change is going to affect all of us. Uh, none of us can ignore it. We see it here in Thailand with elevated CO2 emissions. We see it in, with haze pollution, the cycle of floods and droughts that affects each of us. And we also see it with nearly about 400 odd animal and plant species potentially in the endangered mist in this country. And, and uh, uh, Dr. Harold referred to that at the end, you know, in, in his wildlife trade, in trafficking of wildlife trade comment. Uh, my, my own, I mean, uh, you know, my own sense is that climate change is going to affect each of us. It's going to affect our lives, our, our well-being in many ways. It's going to affect the well-being of future generations. Uh, last month when I was talking to some young women, one of the women told me that climate change invokes the fear of dying young. 
and, 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 and that really gripped me. It just shows what the young people, how they view issues of climate change. Right. And, and uh, it, over the next decade, I see two major trends under this. I see, I see citizen-driven change, along with leadership of the private sector, being uh, forging us forward in adopting green technologies, in reducing carbon emissions, in recycling in many ways. They are going to take us, forge us forward for collective action to address this whole issue of climate change. Innovation is not going to come from anywhere else. It's going to come from, from citizen-driven change and the private sector, from where I see. The second defining trend is the next-gen gov uh, governance. You know, where, where digitization is going to be the, the backbone of service delivery. The governance that we see today, the, the systems of governance that we see today are not going to remain the same, right? And, and in many ways, the systems of governance are going to be driven by, re, by real-time data collection. That is going to be driven by citizens. In many ways, it's going to depend largely on technology, whether it is GIS, it's satellite mapping, it's AI, it's other technologies that are going to drive this. And, and, and all these data are going to come together in an integrated management system, integrated information management system, which is going to allow governments to probably deliver services more rapidly and more accurately, especially during times of crisis. The toolkit of policymakers are going to look very different. Uh, the toolkit is going to consist of, uh, you know, big data analytical skills. That's going to be become that's going to become pretty central. And I want to I want to talk about one example, and and this example comes from Thailand. Uh, I don't know whether you people are aware. The Ministry of Public Health here is piloting a new model of healthcare service. Uh, and, and they're doing it, doing it in one of the provinces of this country where they're institutionalizing telemedicine. So uh, they have divided patients into categories. So patients that do not need to come into the health service or into the health clinic, telemedicine, uh, teleconsultations is becoming the norm. Medicines are going to be delivered at their doorsteps in many ways, right? And for patients that need to come into the health clinic, there are going to be modified pathways for entry, modified pathways to keep health providers safe and to keep, and to keep patients safe by standardizing physical distancing norms in many ways. Similarly with e-learning, I mean, it's going to become the norm. Uh, it's, it's, uh, the next generation is not going to learn uh, in the ways that we people have learned, the way, the way we people have grown up in many ways, right? My very quickly, moving on to the third defining trend, uh, demographic shifts. 2025 is going to be a tipping point in this country where we are going to see elderly surpassing the youth, uh, largely driven by low fertility rate, which is, which is probably going to dip a little lower over the coming 10 years. We need to be smart about building off the long longevity dividend, right? Capitalizing on the elderly, you know, the skills that the elderly put elderly brain for us to be able to, you know, if we are serious about addressing, addressing the demographic shift. However, there's another smaller demographic shift that we are seeing over the coming decade. Younger men, are, are, are fewer younger men are completing their secondary and higher education in this country. The gap is 20%, it's going to widen even more, which means that your labor markets in 10 years time could potentially look different from, from what they look today, right? <laughs> and and that's, 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 that's something that we need to address now. And very quickly, the last defining trend is rising in inequality. This decade has started with higher levels of poverty, middle class shrinking by 12%, uh, inequalities rising, the gap between the rich and the rest of the population is widening, which is only going to deepen social divisions and, pay, and you know, impact the community resilience that, 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 we, that we see in this country. Right. So I'm going to conclude, <laughs> and I'm going to say that if we are serious about addressing these trends, uh, which are going to impact all of us, we have to have a very clear eye focus on building back better, leaving no one behind, 
and bringing youth front and center into addressing the development challenges of today. Over to you, Dr. <laughs> Thank you so much. I think you have set the stage perfectly and identified really the bigger challenges that you know uh, we are facing as uh, as, as a whole. Uh, you know. But um, let me just come back to uh, our next uh, panelist, Dr. Sampan. Uh, Dr. Sampan, you are you know, wearing two hats. One is that you are in the uh, industry, was a technology industry, which has been there for a long time, you yes. know, building many things. And also, you're looking at the future of uh, Thailand's, uh, you know, digitization or digital transformation uh, uh, involved in many agencies. So very briefly, if I may, what do you see are the, the trends that uh, that will come out of the, you know both industry and the government initiatives? Yeah. All right, then thank you for the invitation. Let's pick the first five minutes to sure. yeah. give the heads up to everyone here first. Uh, number one, I think we have been talking a lot about technology disruption during the past five to ten years. But the people are aware, but not much change, not much adapting for themselves. And a lot of people think it's not me, it's somebody else. Until COVID came, and that this cheat tied to tell everyone that we in the moment of double disruption. And who knows, during the next three to five years, I think Dr. Ring just talking about the the COVID-21 or COVID-22. I think the third one have some certain possibility. It might be coming, okay? Let's go to the next one. A lot of people talking about recovery. I, I like this US the, uh, commerce talking about. They are in the K-shape, okay? And between the top line and the bottom line, there are so small lines between, it's not definitely on the top and not at the bottom either. So if you look to the K-shaped recovery, it leads to a lot of things. And I think a lot of people tracking the last few days on the stock price when they're talking about Pfizer vaccine, 90% chance, immediately the stock jump up within a few minutes. Okay, let's go to the next one. This is the message since I have been working in the business, but I have to declare myself, whatever I'm speaking today, nothing to do with the company Western <laughs> Digital. Because otherwise the people, I'm afraid that the people go and buy my share tonight <laughs> and put me on the, the implication with those things. At the moment, during the recovery with the cash share, the business become unusual and every organization looking for the people to work harder with less reward. In my electronic firm, 50% of the company did not do annual wage adjustment this year. 50% because the business unusual and a lot of uncertainty in front. I like this chart, okay? Uh, since the going forward, we're talking about today, him to 2030, there are the business going to happen more and more with no employee, no boss, but non-stop production. And I like to close the first one with, before we talk about the next one. And I think a lot of people read the article about this vulnerability, resilience, agile, and all of those things. I think it leads to we are entering to a lot of micro business with no boss, no employee, very few people, and non-stop of production. And the people at the moment to learn with this type of business, it's going to be the people who have the skill of one side fit all. So that's my first session. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Sampath, for giving us a very interesting perspective on how the business is and people are adapting to, or we are looking forward to changing. And we have to see how, how long term this change will be, whether the big corporations will come back or not, we'll have to see. But that's something that for the second question, the next round. So let me go to our next uh, panelist, uh, David.
David, you have been in many, you know, in many fronts and many hats over the years. So let's see what is your take on what we have been discussing so far. How do you see major changes and where, what are the possibilities, so to speak? Yeah. Um, good, mor good morning, everybody. My mic's very loud. Uh, first of all, thanks to AIT, Dr. Naveed. It's always a pleasure coming up here and doing some stuff. Um, just to give a bit of a background, I mean, my life is split on two sides. I, come, I do a lot of academic work, mostly research, mostly in deep technology, and then I have a commercial side um, where mostly now I do investing. So we invest in a lot of these new technologies, climate technologies, and I did do a good long stint at the UN. So I have a good understanding of the development sector. So when we start to look at the future, I mean, I basically live in a world of facts on one side and I invest in those facts on the other side. But when we look ahead, basically echoing what was said before, mind-blowing disruptions. The next 10 years, if you can imagine a common Chinese person in the year 2010 and where they are now, times two, that's probably in the area where we're going to be. The major disruptions in health, education, security, and employment. Um, just, just go back a bit, Dr. Naveed, yeah. In health, obviously, that's very obvious. Education, we're looking really now at a subscription model, a lifelong subscription model to education. Um, security, we're in sort of a political um, counter-revolution at the moment, this push towards nationalism, and obviously with automation robotics, jobs are under a lot of pressures. Thanks. Massive investments in material science. Material science is sort of the hidden area of investment that nobody talks about, but takes a large amount of financing. So when you look at nanotechnologies, new ways of looking at ocean and marine technologies, um, climate resilient infrastructure, green energy, all these things, material science is gonna have a big win. And it's very interesting when you start to look at where material, things you touch, how much that impacts our daily lives in society, urban and rural areas. Um, digital twinning of the human brain, perfect knowledge. The computational power of machines will reach that of the brain. That will happen. Um, it'll probably happen relatively quickly. There's no way around this. It will happen. And then now, how do you use that? And how do you work on that? We've seen the shift in knowledge, knowledge sharing, knowledge management over the last 10 years, we'll see an exponential shift in access to knowledge over the next 10 years. And that's gonna have a huge impact on reducing some divides, but creating a whole new set of divides in society and the economy. Impact on automation, if you look at robot tax, there's a lot of discussion around that, UBI, universal basic income, and the CBDC, which is the central bank digital currency blockchain but done at a universal scale is going to create a different society and humans are going to be transferring a lot of their decision making ability to machines we start to see that already where machines are making an abundant amount of decisions for humans that will continue on even in the areas of governance micro voting is something that switzerland and some other countries are looking at where they basically vote every single day not once every four years um, so a lot of these things are going to start happening. Society will have a very different view than what we look at right now. So in that sense, social engineering is going to be accelerated. Most societies are engineered um, currently, um, but that will be accelerated. We see a, a fair amount of countries now really getting into this. But social engineering, which basically means that a lot of the changes to humans will happen without humans even knowing it's happening. A lot of this will happen behind the curtains. And I think getting into the last point, basically the bottom line is we live in a, probably the most exciting and the most difficult time ever. And the hashtag on this is really sugarcoating. There is a lot of people putting out optimistic viewpoints of the future. Um, it won't be that nice. It's gonna be a very difficult 10 years ahead of us. Um, but it'll be very exciting and very interesting going forward. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, first of all, uh, let me thank all of you for keeping the time. I'm really glad, you know, that's <laughs> one of my job. And I'm watching it very carefully, it's going very well. So uh, no, what we have seen so far is that we have three perspectives. And I think uh, 
uh, starting from the end, David has given both a positive and a bleak side to it. And I think that's always going to be uh, one of the two, two sides of the coin. And you know, which one falls which direction or how maybe for some people falls this side, for some people falls the other way. So it's not always what is bright future for one, maybe is a bleak for others. So it's going to be that, you know, what you mentioned. So I think it's going to be very interesting to see how these technologies benefit some and not benefit the other. And like Dr. Sampan mentioned about how the workspace, you know, working, working you know, trajectory is changing, how people are adapting to this one, and how businesses, you know, are becoming micro and so on. So it'll be very interesting. And, and of course, your key, key mega trends that you are foreseeing in health and all. So I think uh, that that's really, you know, quite, in, quite uh, enlightening in many ways. So I'm going to put you on spot one by one again mm -hmm. and ask you a specific question and see how you know, we, we go on to that direction. So let, once again, let me start with, uh, with, with Ms. Gita. And I think the, the question I, I, I think uh, is, what uh, are the key uh, drivers that you see that will lead us to the SDGs in 2030? Key drivers, so maybe pick two or three minutes, that'll be great, so we can have some questions too. So thank you. <laughs> great, uh, thanks Dr. Anwar. Uh, I want to build off where I left in terms of key drivers, right? right? The, key, the three key drivers, building back better, right. better leaving mm -hmm. no one behind, mm -hmm. and, and making youth front and center to, today's, to addressing today's development challenges. Building back better, as we all know, is about uh, you know, a greener recovery. How do we use this opportunity to create, to make green recovery the new normal? Um, we've, we've done surveys across countries, 53 economists, uh, sorry, economists from 53 countries have told us that the best way to recover is by adopting green stimulus measures. They said that's the best economic right. rebound. That's going to get you the, your maximum multiplier both in the short and the long term. Right? Uh, SCAP, I don't know, I'm sure people are aware of uh, the UN Economic and Social Commission for Asia Pacific Re uh, Region. They recently did a study for us, a study for the UN, UN office in Thailand, and that tells us that if you're serious about achieving SDGs, we need 50 baht, we need to invest 50 baht per person per day for the coming decade, which isn't a huge investment if you're serious about securing lives, planets, and people in many ways, right? If you're serious about right. securing prosperity, and I feel that the private sector has a big role to play in this. And as, as I said, I see private sector and citizen-driven change as, as the key factors that are going to collectively move us forward in building back better. Leaving no one behind. You know, leaving no one behind builds off uh, the values of justice, equality, and equity. Our analysis is telling us in the current context, we are seeing seven different stakeholder groups that are being left behind. Right, we are seeing people, disabled people, we are seeing migrants, we are seeing, uh, we are seeing ethnic minorities living in remote geographies of the country that are likely to be left behind, right, amongst, amongst others. Um, also, we are also seeing private sector being much more ambitious in, in adopting uh, policies to secure a, f a fairer and, and more responsible tomorrow, right? And I feel that this is the time when we, the United Nations, the private sector, uh, the academia and others need to come together to see how we can, we can make this possible. And my last one is about the youth, sure. right? Mm -hmm. And, and I, I, I mean, I, I really believe that uh, leadership of the youth is extremely critical to decide the future that we want. We need to redouble our efforts, of finding ways to engage with the youth, talk to them, and, and bring them and build partnerships with them for sustainable development goals. We need their minds to find solutions to tomorrow's and today's development challenges. So I'm going to stop there. Thank you so much. I think you have actually, you know, as I say, hit the hammer on the, on the head exactly on these areas, and uh, uh, and that ties very well into what AIT is also, you know, and especially in, the, in, in terms of the youth development, in terms of taking care of the the people which are uh, less advantaged. So all of those things are also central to what AIT works on. So just continue with uh, Dr. Sampan with Job. So I'm, I will, I'm going to ask you about the, what the, the workforce or workplace, you already mentioned a little bit about that. Yep. So maybe if you can elaborate more on that so we can continue with your discussion and see as a private you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, industry, how do you see that changing in a little bit more detail? Okay, number one, if you look to it, for the past 
15, 20 years, automation came. And nobody noticed because a lot of frontline workers got reduced by six or seven times. You know, I give you, for example, in the industry. In the old way, the old legacy, the manufacturing line, they used to have about 100 people, now down to 15. But the people at 85 are moving to run with other business or industry. So no one detect that on the automation web one. But web two is coming and start to hit the white collar people. Okay, next one. Data to decision will shorten the whole supply chain between the front to the back end. And that will eliminate the next one. The organization structure, the legacy that we have been building for 100 years with seven or eight layers, every one tier or four year get one step promotion and promotion and promotion. Some people 10 years get five times of promotion. Because the layer and the hierarchy of organization will become shut and clean back to the no boss, no employee thing. Next one. These four are, I like this chart a lot because will be next, since we have only three minutes. <laughs> the retire will be more and not limited to any age. If you're not fit, <laughs> you, go. you should change. Okay? The people who be retained will be retrained. And the recruit will be so small from now. That's why I say that the business type, industry type, will change to the micro small form of factors with it. Very few people to learn with the di digital service, digital marketing type of the business. Next one. So this being to the, the, the cheat that I want to speak today that that's why you see the government talking a lot during the past few years under Mahesi, Ministry of Higher Education, that the people have to upskill, reskill. At the same time, the university, the education have to teach the new skill for the people. Next. University class from now on, the demand side want to focus on the soft skill. And we want the multiplier to come to work with the business. Don't keep us with diminution. <laughs> Next one. Last but not least, education cannot run in the silo way anymore. Government have to come in and help, or university have to partner together, get the best of yourself, merge with the other university. At the same time, go and collaborate with the business industry. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Dr. Sam, you have given us uh, actually a very uh, good model for AIT. Maybe we should talk to you after this panel in more detail. <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> so we can actually follow this uh, path, especially, I mean, uh, really what you have identified is exactly what the disruption in universities is being talked about in many places. And I think this is a very good recipe or a summary uh, that we have seen. And I think it really feeds into what AIT is looking forward to in transformation as even mentioned in the morning. So uh, let's continue to the last panelist. We still will left with about 10 minutes of questions. I'm, I'm quite happy to, to report that. So you have mentioned about many really uh, transformative things. In, in, you know, so coming back to continue your discussion on what do you think a common life person's life, how that might be in 2030. Let me just interject a little bit that, as, as you know, there's a movie called Back to the Future, and they had this 2015. Uh, when the was, movie was there in, in 1985, so they had 2015 as their future. And many people measured what we achieved compared to that movie on the common man's life. So let me see what you see in 2030. <laughs> and we'll talk again. <laughs> I mean, if we, if, we, if we take that theme of Back to the Future, if you go back to, let's say, 1990, just before the internet was really becoming a very broad, broadly accepted technology, and the internet is a relatively unsophisticated technology. It's not a very sophisticated technology. 
you could you could lose your job within a couple of weeks. You can learn how to make a website within a couple of weeks. You can start a company, and all of a sudden you're a web founder, right? You're part of the dot com. And but if you look at what happened because of the introduction of the internet onto the world and how that had a big impact on entrepreneurship, on investment capital, on um, the disruptions that happened and that ripple effect that happened afterwards and over the last, let's say, 10 or 15 years. Um, when we start to look at the future, we've got six major clusters of technology coming down the pipeline, very sophisticated um, technologies coming down the pipeline. A lot of it's invisible technology integrated into the system, into the society, without society really knowing much about it, without them playing much of a part of it. And that's going to have this big impact. So what we're going to see to the, for the common man is really the introdu introduction of a technology divide, which we don't necessarily have. We had a little bit with the internet, but the access to technology um, will create a new divide, technology divide, that those that have more money will be able to afford some of this to take advantage and leverage the new technologies. Those that don't will not. And that will have a big impact on health and education. Education, again, is going through a major disruption at the moment. Um, and it will have a big impact on employment. I mean, my generation is probably the last generation that will formally retire. You know, stop working at 60. Somebody's going to pay my bills until I'm dead. Um, I have three daughters. I don't think they're going to be in that situation where they're going to work for a company and somebody's going to pay the retirement. So retirement is basically gone. So lifelong learning comes into play. And a lot of these skills now, these new skills, come into play. And if you look at, for example, even right now, the biggest growing, growing group of entrepreneurs from an investment standpoint are senior citizens, 50 plus. Mm -hmm. Not the young kids, mm -hmm. it is the 50 plus, those that have a lot of experience, have a lot of understanding of the power dynamics of working in organizations and corporations, and is now taking that skill out, looking at a market, finding gaps, and creating new companies. And this is the big, and they will be using a lot of the technology Specifically on Asia, I think the, the chairman had mentioned that Asia is going to be one of the forefronts of a lot of this new technology. And it won't be because of investment, it'll be because of the lack of uh, regulation. North America and Europe are very overregulated. Asia is relatively underregulated. So a lot of the new technology is going to get on the ground here first. So Asia is going to have an advantage. Because of the youth bubble on one side and the age bubble on the other side that we have in Asia, that will also now become a bit of an advantage. But what it will set up is sort of this generational competition for employment. Old people are not gonna leave creating gaps for new people to get new jobs, right? So there's gonna be a generational divide in the employment space where younger people are really gonna have to fight for employment because a lot of the older people are not leaving employment. So there's a lot of shifting that's gonna happen that we see in the future. And I would say for the top 20%, they probably won't notice much of a difference. They'll have a nice life and they'll continue that nice life. Um, the bottom, bottom of the pyramid, the BOP, I think they are gonna have a more of a struggle. When you look at automation, it is impacting um, a lot of uh, low-skilled jobs. A lot of those low-skilled jobs, unfortunately, are being done by women at the moment. So the big, negative impact will be probably against woman employment in the future, unfortunately. Um, and then the middle class, they will slowly realize that their life is not going to be as easy as they thought, that it's going to be much more destabilized life, that they will have to, there's no job guaranteed, their education isn't guaranteed, things aren't guaranteed, the economy is not guaranteed. So they're going to have to be more agile and they're going to have to be much more in tune. And that leads into what the doctor was saying here around education this lifelong education, the subscription model of, of education will become very prominent. Um, so it's not all bright, as you <laughs> were saying, <laughs> but it's not all dark. Okay. <laughs> so thank you so much. And you know, we were thinking to form an advisory board of the AIT Enterprises Alliance, and I think I found my first three advisors on the board. <laughs> so with that, um, uh, let me, if we still have a few minutes left, so may I invite some questions from the, from the audience? Uh, uh, otherwise, we could have a little bit more discussion, a concluding one after that. So any, any questions? Because this is a great opportunity to look at some, what I would call, futurist 
uh, in the definition of Elvin Doffler because we're looking at the possibilities uh, that might happen. So anybody would like to venture a question? I know asking the first question is always hard, so. A ask the hardest question you can come up with. <laughs> Quite That's literally. Right. That's right. Ask the hard Something question. that you really think is not answerable. <laughs> Yes, Dr. Ali. So we have uh, the hardest question for the most prominent person in the hall. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, um, all of us who are involved in trying to make Thailand an even better we are wondering how, how can the private sector and government better cooperate so that where the private sector is interested in results and the government sector is interested in process, how can we get together and, and survive in this very challenging environment? Because the technologies, they go so fast and the world changes, well, every, every year changes faster. And how can Thailand keep up with that? Yeah. Maybe Dr. Sampan, you want to take that? <laughs> because you are on the both sides, as I understand, and maybe after David, and then maybe a quick comment from everyone. Yeah, yeah just, just during the past 20 years that I moved myself out from day-to-day -day work, work with university, education, and the government, uh, the trend is getting better and better. The new government recently that I have been, I mean, sticking with is start to talk a lot with the collaboration, what the private sector want. But whenever we move forward, down to the execution is a lot of interference, some new thing is coming tomorrow, and the focus it gets getting a little bit loosening. And you know, a lot of government today challenge with the short term critics and all of those things, even pull a lot of focus and leave those type of work down to the second and third layer, but it's not the bad side. We see the better trend, and like I myself, recently during the past few years, I have been spent most of the time with the government and university. Yes, thank you. Uh, David, you want to come Yeah, I, yeah. Would, I would say you... Just quickly, just briefly, because we have one more question coming in, yeah. I mean, you see, you see private, public sector being privatized anyways, so there's a lot of privatization going on, but you play to your strength, right? And the strength of private sector is risk management and efficiencies, that's what they do and they do it extremely well. They're very efficient because they've got a bottom line and they manage risk very well. What governments used to do is really create that safety net. Support those that can do it by themselves and help those that can't do it by themselves. So I think if private sector were to take that strength over as well as governments taking the strength of efficiency um, over, I think that's where the, the collaboration, that's where that sweet spot is gonna be where a private sector doing public good work very efficiently, very effectively, managing that risk, but also creating the safety nets, whether that is climate, whether that is along any of these sort of um, verticals. Okay, all right, thank you so much, David. Uh, briefly? <laughs> very, very, uh, very quickly. There's no easy answer to your question. I wish we had the answer. <laughs> but uh, from where I sit, I see uh, formal, informal channels of influencing policy as the best way forward. Um, and, and, and policy making in the future needs to look different from what it currently looks, right? It needs to be more data driven. It needs to be uh, results orientated. And, and uh, using formal informal channels of collaboration, partnership is the only way forward. Within the UN, we've got something called the uh, Global Compact Network for Thailand, which brings private sector, government, and the United Nations together to basically address some of these development challenges that we are currently facing and provides a platform for us uh, to dialogue with, uh, with, with the, the, with the two, two key partners. Right. Thank you. The platforms like this are what I need. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. We have one more question. Maybe yeah, two more. So, uh, Dr. Subin? <laughs> And then, uh, which I start after you. Yes. Thank you. My name is Subin. I'm engineer by training. <laughs> and my son also is engineer, engineer by training. Both of I uh, would like to, I don't have question, but after listening 
uh, all your, the presentation, I feel that nobody can answer the <laughs> question. I myself, I, I have one son and one grandson. And my grandson now, he is on the 11th or 12th grade going to university. I cannot advise him what subject <laughs> he should, should learn in the university. But I told him when he was 11th grade, at 10th grade. Uh, what do you like the subject that you are learning? But he like everything, you know, like mathematics, like science, and social, and everything. But I told him that uh, you should study what sub the subject that you like most. And he told me he like golfing. So last year, I sent him to the boarding school in the U.S. Uh, the, in the morning, he attend the regular uh, class, cl classes. And in the afternoon, he attend the golf school. <laughs> but he would like to be a professional. <laughs> so I let him decide by himself. Nobody knows that what subject one should learn. I think you should learn and do what you like, you love to do. That is my, uh, my views. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Ben. Yeah, so we have the last question, maybe? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Navid. Uh, my privilege uh, to ask a question to this high-level panel, primarily directed to David. Uh, or anybody uh, can add later on. Uh, I'm Ishtiak, uh, Councillor, Embassy of Bangladesh here in Bangkok. Uh, I'm just thinking that uh, as uh, David reflected on ordinary person's life uh, beyond 2030, so I was thinking that um, the challenging life of uh, the ordinary people of the developing country like one of them is Bangladesh. So, keeping that in mind, um, what could be uh, the area, the private sector, both uh, domestic and international, can reflect uh, to make uh, the life of the ordinary people of a developing country easier and, and elevate, make anxiety free, feeling them safer. Thank you. Yeah. So basically he's asking the brighter version of your bleak future. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, Bangladesh has done extremely well. I mean, if you look at two projects, microfinance and the a to i project, the digitalization of di to the last mile in Bangladesh has done immense um, contribution to society there and to the world for that matter. So you've got two exa great examples coming out. But the, the question is really on how you base your economy. And if you base your economy on low cost production in a world where the cost of automation is drastically decreasing and the cost of employment or labor is increasing, it's simply a matter of time when automation is gonna come in. So you can have a lot of people that are basically unemployed and what you do with that. So you've got some arguments around universal basic income, and that's probably something that low-cost economy nations should be exploring. Finland, Canada, I mean, I'm Canadian, uh, we're already doing that right now. So universal basic income is one area, and then that probably shift into the humanities around the education, because I think the real, there's gonna be a major shift into anthrosocial, in behavioral, types of um, studies in the future around education, that's gonna become extremely valuable in this type of stuff. But digitalization <laughs> is probably, <laughs> digitalization and access to finance gives independence at the very lowest level of the economic social status, and that's where creativity and innovation really start to come in. And they do, they do that. You see that in Thailand. Even the poorest of the poor here are really innovative and creative. Um, and they're now starting to get the technology and the government support to really explore that. So that's, I, I would say that's probably the way to do it. Thank you. So very briefly, Dr. Samban, because we have run out of time, but yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. Just, just a short ad. I think 
I, my thinking is, we need to look inside out. Let prepare the people in the country. I think a lot of people talking about the soft skill, some of digital technology skill, and on the top of those, get yourself strong because a lot of uncertainty in the future. And when the people inside are strong and become active, I think the opportunity will come. Thank you so much. I think that's a very positive note. So let me thank all of you. Uh, really, it's been uh, very inspiring and uh, very educa educational, I would say, uh, discussion. And uh, we have been very true to, I hope, to the, to the, to the intent of the panel. So thank you so much, uh, Gita and uh, uh, Samphan and David. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.